exciting event. Before I turn things over to them, just a couple of housekeeping things. Please turn off or silence your cell phones. Masks are to be worn in the whole uh, in the building the whole evening. Sign books are for sale at the register, and CJ will be personalizing afterwards. Recording available on YouTube where everything goes well. And the store <laughs> and the store closes at 9 p.m. Our interviewer for this evening is Isaac Fitzgerald. Isaac appears frequently in the Today Show and is the author of the best-selling children's book How to Be a Pirate, as well as the co-author of Pen and Ink and Knives and Ink, winner of an IACP award. His writing has appeared in the New York Times. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, do my talk loud. You hear me? All right. Um, his writing has appeared in the New York Times and the Guardian and the American Not Required Reading and in numerous other publications. He lives in Brooklyn. He'll be speaking with our featured author, C.J. Hauser. C.J. teaches creative writing at Colgate University. She is the author of two novels, Family of Orders and The From Away. Her work has appeared in The House, Narrative Magazine, The Paris Review, Tri-Quarterly, Esquire, Third Coast, Teen Review, The Guardian, and The New York Times. Okay. Uh, <laughs> The Crane Walk is her first work of nonfiction. Her new book, The Crane Walk, was named a most anticipated book of 2022 by Time Magazine. Ten days after Cole off her wedding, Harvey went on an expedition to Texas to study the whooping crane. After a week wading through the Gulf, she realized she almost signed up to live someone else's life. In this intimate, frank, and funny memoir in essays, Hauser releases herself from traditional narratives of happiness and goes looking for ways of living I love the living of the unexpected, making it all the same along the way. So you're in for a tree, obviously. Hauser will read from her book, and I just want to join her in this conversation, and you'll have a chance to ask questions after that. So please join me in welcome and see you again. I do. Uh, they had been dead for one in five years. My grandparents had both been cremated, 
put me down nothing with them. I was worried it was wrong for me to perform this ritual on my own. Isn't this a thing we should do, like, as a family? I asked my mother. Everyone will be thrilled if you do it, my mother says. Me like a favor. Call Randy, I say. Her brother, the son of the Cremains. Ask Leslie, I say, of my sister. It's fine, my mother says. No one will mind. Holy shit, I say. I'm not doing this unless you call and everyone agrees. I realize this may sound strange to you, but my uncle lives abroad. My sister had just had a baby. My mother and father had just spent three painful years providing 24-7 care for my grandmother as her Alzheimer's sick old and her body weakened. And they did this with levels of patience and grace that were something close to saintly. Everyone in my family was very busy with their own families, except me. My other family was Marta and Monica, but we were not perceived as a family. I called my mother a few days later and learned that not only is my uncle okay with this plan, he has made me a ranked list of optimal beaches for ash scattering. What's optimal, I asked. My uncle's list of viable beaches is weighted according to two factors. Factor number one is how much my grandparents like the beach. Factor number two is how likely I am to be arrested for scattering human remains. <laughs> I have been asking my mother to give me the ashes for days, and eventually she admits she does not have them. Where are they, I ask. The funeral home, she says, which means my grandmother's ashes have been at the funeral home for nearly a year. They are commingling her with your granddad. Can you tell me something, I ask. I thought granddad was scattered in the mountains. I thought the rancheros took him for one last trail ride. The rancheros are a sort of cowboy fraternity my grandfather joined when he moved to the San Inez Valley in California. They did things like sneak into one another's barns at night and paint one another's horses in primary colors, even though they were in their 70s and everyone in the county owned a gun. <laughs> my grandmother had been part of their sister group who I swear to God were called the Phillies. It was my understanding that there was a spot along their annual trail ride in the mountains where fallen rancheros could be scattered. And this was what I thought had become of my grandfather's ashes. Mm. My mother shakes her head. They only scattered one scoop of him, she says. <laughs> A scoop of... Your grandmother said she'd mailed him his ashes, but then she thought she might want them to be together. So she only took one detergent scoop of his ashes and mailed it off to the ranch nose in a jiffy bag. <laughs> a jiffy bag? She nods solemnly. The rest she kept because she wanted to be commingled with him. And they did it already. I just have to go pick them up, and I keep forgetting. I've been a little busy. Just don't get weird and forget on purpose to give me the ashes, I say. I'll be home again next week. Just remind me if it looks like I'm forgetting, she says. I leave early the next morning, and before I do, I try to think of what I could possibly write on a scrap of paper to remind my mother to pick up her parents' coming of ashes that won't feel like waking up to a post-it that says, don't forget about your parents. <laughs> I go to the laundry room and find the scoop for the detergent. I write, don't forget, on a scrap of paper and put it in the scoop. I leave it on the kitchen counter. I am two hours into my drive when my phone dings. My father's text reads, oh my god. My phone dings again. My mother says, I'm on it. Unauthorized. Oh, I have, I have page markings. I really did. You guys, this is the first time we're doing this tonight, and so it's a little struggle bossy. <laughs> but here we are. <laughs> Unauthorized obituary for my grandma. Maureen Joyce was addicted to internet Tetris. She had a borderline erotic relationship with an ornamental harm specialist online in Japan, whom she messaged at all hours of the night about rare koi colorations. Maureen Joyce favored hot pink lipstick and wedge sandals and referred to the hairstyle she wore for 30 years as her perfect wig. Maureen Joyce said the day she could no longer do her own eyeliner perfectly was the day she'd come and take care of things with a smothering pillow, and in this we failed her. <laughs> Maureen Joyce once saw Marilyn Monroe in a restaurant and said she had bigger feet than you would have thought. <laughs> Maureen Joyce smuggled rare plant cuttings across international borders in her hat band. <laughs> Maureen Joyce had a foul mouth and cursed exquisitely. Toward the end, she was forgetting things, but she was always squeezing her granddaughter's hands and telling them, whatever you do, live an interesting fucking life. The last thing we ever told Maureen Joyce was how we loved her. After that, for good measure, we told her not to pick up any sales.
Insecurities, but I feel like let's give you this. Hello. Is this is better. Yeah, Yay! All right, fantastic. Um, well, listen, I just after such a wonderful, beautiful reading, I want to start with that as a topic, which is: Can you talk about one of the things that I love about this collection is how much humor there is in it? You're tackling incredibly difficult uh, topics, but you add a lot of humor. Like, is, is that something you found on the page? What was the balance? There? Like, how does anyone survive this life without making, I don't know, that's the kind of family that I grew up in, where real gallows humor sort of big. Uh, a lot of us, and sometimes laughing about things feels really healing and really great and really freeing, and sometimes laughing about things is because people don't want to take them seriously, and that feels not so great. Uh, so it's, it's a mixed bag, but it's, um, I don't know how to get through the day without it. <laughs> do, you, do you feel like it's something you both rely on in your writing and in your life? Oh, like, yeah, absolutely. 100%. My students would tell you the same thing, I am sure, is that I keep telling them that I'm assigning them funny stories, and then they come to class and they're like, everyone is dead. Why is everyone dead? I'm like, but it's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> it was like one of those humor, you know, life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, first strike, everyone loved it. <laughs> 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 Literally, I'm a great writer, I'm a great writer, but... Wait, no, now I want like your top 10 funniest short stories that are actually just like darkly, darkly depressing. Yes, okay, are we- are I won't this? buy, I meant that after, but no, go. Amy Bloom, Love is Not a Pie, Maria Ray, Nova Stryka, um, what's the other one that the students always get so mad at me about? Um, we'll come back to this, we'll come back to this. We can make a syllabus if you want to be really, yeah, like, yeah. No, we 100% want that. All right, so I wanted to talk about the process of growing the collection yeah. out of the crane life, out of that essay, which is like, did you always see that essay as an anchor for a kind of a larger narrative about your life, about romantic choices, or was this something that was like already in the works? No, I'm a, I'm a spiteful jerk, and I had no intention of writing a whole book at all, and it was only because lovely people who helped build this book with me were like, what if you thought about it? And if people on the internet were like, where is the book about this? And I was like, that's really nice and terrifying. Uh, and I was spiteful, and I was like, I, I don't, I don't want to do a thing because the internet said so, and that felt wrong to me. And so I was really in denial about it for a long time, and I was working on this novel. Um, and then I was locked up in the haunted mansion that is the auto <laughs> for a while. And while I was there, I kept coming up with ideas of things. I'm like, actually, I am pretty interested in this, and I am pretty interested in that. And when the pandemic swooped in, in particular. My novel is about people fighting over a swimming pool, and that didn't feel urgent to me. <laughs> and I think then I got really, really interested in the work of the nonfiction. So yeah, everyone always has to take me kicking and screaming towards my own best interest, and that's what happened. Well, I'm really glad that that team assembled and dragged you, because it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, did you, like, I mean, you know, you've written fiction. Was, was it a different process for you? Do you have, when you sit down on the page, does it feel differently, or? I think I really flipped every other day in terms of like, oh yeah, this is like so much easier than fiction in the sense that it's like, I know what happened and then it's like structuring the material that already exists. And then on the flip side, it's like time to sit down and write about my bad choices again. <laughs> or to write about things that really matter to me, that make me happy or that are hard. And I think that's a different way of being at the desk than I've been before. Even though there were things that I really cared about in the novels, like passionately, it was easy to be like, it's a little puppet play that I'm putting on about my issues, as opposed to, here they are. Um, and I got some really beautiful edits <laughs> along the way that were less edits and more, more like uh, therapy. Um, and it was like, so in this scene, it seems like you're really blaming yourself for this. But like, what if the character didn't? And I'm like, but I do. And they're like, but what if you did? <laughs> so it was. It was an intense emotional process, and I really am grateful for it. Yeah, I mean, not to stick you to the wall on that one, though. What did that like in that moment? Were you like, oh, maybe I should rethink it, or you're like, okay, I'm gonna forgive myself in the book, but keep punishing myself in real life. the second one. Wow, no, no thought, but like just. It was helpful. It was helpful to rethink it. It's like when someone gives you really, really good advice, and you know it's true, and you try to take it every day, but you don't always succeed. 
Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's fair, and I think we're finding a thread here in the conversation. We're just also very human, yeah, right? Yeah. Which is what this collection is as well. Um, listen, uh, this is addressed in the book and the delivery, of course. But I just want to ask, what is it? so you're you're writing nonfiction for the first time, or you know, in in such a large form. What was what is your ethos on essay collections? Like, should it read as a collection? Like, or do you see it as like, oh, it should be a mixtape, like different subject matters, different things, or like, do you think it should be an overarching theme? Do you care? I I think that everyone should do. I think that the shape of an essay collection, if it's like, especially if it's about the author's life, it should reflect however the author thinks about their life, and maybe that's super fragmented, and maybe that's like, I need to make a thing together and make meaning. And for me, writing this book, I definitely knew it was going to be fragmented and bringing a lot of different topics and subject matters, because that's what it feels like to be me alive in the world. Um, but I knew I wanted the book to take all these disparate experiences I had and make meaning from them, because I think that I have felt garbagey in life when it's like my life doesn't seem to fit some sort of legible narrative of like, what is happiness? What does it look like? How do you communicate it to someone else? So I wanted it to be both super fragmented and weird. Um, and to have all the different bits so we speak to their own present moments. But I wanted the reader passing through to feel like, and all of that matter. Like, that's not your life anymore. You're not hung up on it anymore. But it really mattered. And so that wasn't like time wasted. Or that didn't, like, that wasn't you waiting in the wings for your life to start. But for people who just want to write essay collections that aren't linked, like, let the essay collection be an essay collection. For God's sake. <laughs> Let people do it. <laughs> Let it be a mosaic. Yeah, Let it be this. Yeah. We should and it doesn't even have to be a picture. It can just be very pretty and sparkly and broken, but it's all part of life. Sparkly and broken. Yeah, <laughs> sparkly and broken. Tattoos afterwards. Yes. Um, <laughs> To that point, though, uh, one of the questions we were talking beforehand, uh, sorry to spoil that for you, but there's a little prior conversation. Uh, you said one of your things that you wanted to be asked about a lot, and obviously some of my favorite parts of the book, but robots and gravestones. Robots and gravestones. So to give you, to give you a feel, if though, for those who haven't read it, the disparate natures that we have, uh, what made you go after John Belushi's gravestone? What, what made you go after robots? Yeah, those are two essays that are about obsessions of mine, but totally different kinds of obsessions, and I think the thing that has been the most fun for me as a person now doing nonfiction and exploring nonfiction, it's like, I, for the Belushi essay, my mom tells me this story that is like clearly inconspicuous and false, um, but like delightfully so. And I sort of was like, okay, I want to go find out like, what is this actual story? Not because I wanted to prove her wrong, that she has feared, but because, <laughs> I don't know, I just was really, really interested. What she told me was that John Belushi was exhumed and they moved his brain and that they had done it because of her godparents and grieving of tequila underwear on the ground parties. And I was like, I don't think those people let's find out. Um, it was so fun to take a question and to know that that story hit an emotional chord with me, which I didn't really realize was about my grandmother's passing and to just like reading it. And to go like on walkabout and to like start unpacking it and exploring it and for the writing of it to follow along. The robot convention essay is like a whole other bag of my issues, which is that I went to a robot convention in 2013 just because I wanted to, <laughs> because I think robots are fascinating, and so I just like went to this robot convention and missed Christmas Eve dinner with my family, um, and I knew I needed to be there and I knew I was interested, and I, it took me eight years to write the essay, and when this book started coming together, I was like, it's time. <laughs> it's time for everyone to know about the robots, and I think even as I was writing about it, the first couple drafts, if you had read them, you would have been like, I'm all learning about robots. <laughs> and it took writing about it to be like, yeah, I've been obsessed with this for a really long time. And I think, I don't know, like our own memories are like that too sometimes. Like, why do I think of that day so often, that person so often, that whatever? And then you keep returning to it until you can make some sort of meaning out of it for you. Not that it isn't the case. It's if you decide what it means to you, that's how it what does that feel like for you? I mean, just thinking about what you just said about the Blue Sheet essay, like when you just when it, you have that aha moment, and like you've just been kind of floundering, throwing words around, trying to figure the thing out. Yeah, it's usually a combination of like the highest high and like yes, aha, I've done it, and also like oh, some smart readers told me something kind of like this two months ago, and I didn't listen to them. It's usually both. It's usually both. So you're saying that like somebody was at and they were like, oh, what about this idea? And you're like, absolutely not. But then. Like, I think agents, editors, friends and writing groups, like, I, I think that people who know you well see what you're up to, sometimes more easily than we see what we're up to. 
Um, and they're like, hey, I know you. I see what you're doing here. And that's, um, sometimes it's hard to accept, but that's like a very beautiful friendship story, actually. It's like, yeah, I'm going to call you on your shit. That, that's part of this. And I love it. And that can be a beautiful moment in a relationship, be it with an editor, an agent, a friend. Um, can you talk a little bit about a moment in the book where that, where you maybe realized what you were doing, you were writing about it, you didn't realize what had been happening while you were doing it yeah. in real life, but as you're writing, you're just like, oh, shit. And like, actually, maybe it was like, yeah. No, it was like oh shit, yeah. Yeah, there were kind of a lot of them, but the one that I think has really stood to me the most is I kept writing about this VR simulator at the robot convention where they put these like goggles on me with Google eyes, and then they were like, you are this robot, and you're like, now I'm going to reach out to be this robot. And I kept writing about it, and everyone was like, that seems cool. And I, and I passed out. The thing is, I passed out. In the end, I got so cool at the simulation that I, I don't faint normally, and I fainted. What was that about? And I think the process of writing about it and talking to people about it, I was like, oh, the whole essay is about how I'm often sort of stuck in a dialectic, like an unhealthy, codependent dialectic with people that I am in a relationship with romantically and otherwise. And in the simulation, I was alone. I was alone for a butt and a void. <laughs> and I had to pick up an object, but I couldn't figure out which one to pick up because I didn't know who I was picking it up for. Of course, the question then is that like a normal or adjusted person would think, like, it's for me. But like, I, feel, <laughs> I couldn't do that. And so I knew, again, it's one of those things. You know the scene is important. I think that's such a cool thing to understand about us as writers. I'm sure some of you are writers, but I know you have um, But like that moment where like, I know this matters to me, and I don't know why yet, but that's OK. I'm just going to write it and write toward it. And so yeah, that was a cool thing to learn about myself. <laughs> 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 she says with a smile. And I think that's incredible, and the question is the sense of place. And there, I mean, many, many different places, like very disparate. So is there some, like, something in your writing where you're like, is place super important to you, that like, you seek it out, you're, you're focusing on that through your writing, or is that just something that, like, you are just drawn to many different weird spots? <laughs> I mean, part of it is just that if you're a rogue, artist, academic person, you don't get, you just get told where you live next, and like, it's like, that's where the paycheck comes from, so now I live in Tallahassee, Florida. Um, so that's part of it. But I think, too, yeah, spaces matter a lot to me, geography matters a lot to me. When I live in different parts of the world, it affects how I move through the world, how I feel in my body. I feel like there's like a climate of like an emotional climate you're in as well, and it creates like, I'm going to say the word vibe at a rating. I didn't want to do that tonight, but it really <laughs> creates a vibe. And like, I think that so many of these stories, they matter that they happened where they happened. It matters that they're in like a mall called Destiny in Syracuse or a bungalow full of lizards in Tallahassee. Like, that's part of it. Do you, I mean, do you, do you seek those places out, though? Or are you like, I mean, I know you're saying that's where you go to, for the paycheck, but like, is there a part of you that's like, a robot? Like, that wasn't an assigned story to you, no, right? You right, were, right, right, like, like, there's a part of you that's like, I want to go find, like, what's it like to try and explore the world that way? Yeah. Um, Are you drawn to the strange, I guess, is what yes. I think I am. <laughs> <laughs> no, I am. Like, I, I don't know, over in January, I had been, like, looking at Airbnbs in New Mexico, and I was like, oh, I want to go to Santa Fe, where will I go? And then all of a sudden, this thing came up called an Earthship. <laughs> and I was like, what is an Earthship? And, like, pan to three months later, I'm in three different Earthships, and, like, going to a rave for a woman who just bought land to join the community, and I'm, like, learning which shampoos will kill the ecosystem in my Earthship. And, like, I don't know, I find things interesting, and then I just follow them. I just like yes into them, and a part of the other people don't don't do that as much. I highly I recommend it, but I enjoy doing it. I don't know any other way to be. Yeah, there's no judgment here. <laughs> it's a very safe space. But what do you know about earthships? Don't you want to go be in an earthship? Well, I'm gonna follow up. I've got a lot of questions here. Are we are we talking like a Pauly Shore biodome circa 19? <laughs> like what what is an earthship? I did not know. Holy short reference was a thing I hoped for tonight till right now. Listen, it's a good movie. <laughs> so it's like kind of like that in the sense that it's meant to be like self-sustaining, but it's like an individual dwelling that this architect who is mostly uh, like how much time do you have? Like, because I'll talk to you about Richard for a really long time. He started building in the 80s, um, and there are these self-sustaining shelters in the desert. But what I was really interested in about is that they were not built to code, 
um, obviously, because he's just like going rogue and building good ships. Uh, and so they shot him down. They're like, you can't build here. And then he put on a suit. This is a man who does not wear a suit. He put on a suit. And he went to like town hall and he campaigned forever. It's not like a real suit. Sorry, I was picturing an Earth ship suit. Trying to figure out what that was. Sorry, go, sorry, sorry, go, 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 go. So, like he put on like an actual human. I am a man who will go to city hall suit. Mm. And he made them make him what he called a proving ground. So it was like a place where code was suspended and he could build whatever he wanted. And that was both because he wanted to build whatever he wanted, but the idea was like if you're going to make sustainable dwellings. The code is part of the problem. So if you keep building things to code, we keep redoubling down on the same systems. And he's like, we want to think about actual learning. You have to build the things and fuck up and fuck up and fuck up. Um, and I just thought, that's incredible. Like, that's incredible ecologically. That's incredible in terms of learning. This is kind of a book about me <laughs> building a lot of faulty earth ships in my own life and then being like, the next one's going to be not set on fire. Like, I don't know. I think I, think I was really drawn to that. Yeah. yeah. I, sorry, just I feel like I just had one of those aha moments <laughs> while, you're, while you're talking through this. But that, that brings me to my next question, which is this is nonfiction something you're absolutely going to pursue now? Like, is this something you always saw as an arrow in your quiver? And <laughs> No. No, this is a surprise. But now that I'm doing it, I don't know. I'm never going to not write fiction. It's, it's what I do. It's, I can't not have imaginary friends. I, I have a lot of imaginary friends. Um, but. Now when I get obsessed with something like Earthships, it's like, yeah, I'm going to write about that. I, I think that's going to be part of how I make sense of those obsessions in my life. I make them, I don't know, intelligible to other people who may or may not want to know about them. And, and also connect with what you're talking about. One of the things uh, in the question that really spoke to me a lot is you're grappling with parenting. Yeah. And that is something that I myself and I think many people here in this room can maybe understand that or are getting ready to grapple with it. Um, was it? Difficult to like was that something that came out through like something you've been grappling with for a while building up to this or was that something that like was happening at the at the at the moment of writing it was it because of the pandemic yeah. like and and not trying to get too personal I apologize like it's also in the book but no the, the book has I have no filter in the book and so this is like truly on the table <laughs> yeah okay um, no I think it wasn't something I thought I was gonna write about it's something I've always thought about but it's not something I thought I was gonna write about. And then I believe it was my dear British editor who said that she said, say, an emotional lacuna in the book, where I had managed to write an entire book about my life at times and never talked about having a body or parenthood. And my first response was like, I don't have to. I can only talk about our ships and robots. It's fine. Um, and then I, again, out of spite, because I'm a stubborn child, like, wrote a thing. Well, I guess if I did write an essay about that, it would kind of be about, I don't know, my relationship to my body and how it's changed over time, and also these five ideas that I've been thinking about for a really long time. I was like, yeah, okay, write that. Um, I think it was really helpful for me to write about it. Um, the essay is sort of a couple different strands about separating the question about having children, having children, like what does that actually mean? And I think often the question gets treated as like, yeah, like you meet a partner and then you love each other and you have a baby in the end. And that's great. If that's the way you live your life, that's totally great. But like my life has never been that simple. And so it's about pulling apart the threads of like, what are the things you want or don't want in terms of like being a parent, doing that with your body, doing that with a partner, doing that with a partner's genes. Like there are all these different things that like more of course society wants us to think of as all one packet and parcel. And I think I had trouble answering that question for myself until I sort of, the essay's called uncoupling, like pulled apart all the different pieces of it. And so the process of writing it was really cool because like you can separate all the threads on the page and sort of look at them. And that was, yeah, that was a surprise that that part of being part of the book. But, and you also felt like you were learning while you were doing it. Yeah, totally. Can I ask about the diving into the romance of your life and yeah. the past, or uh, anti-romance? <laughs> I mean, how, how do we want to put it? Uh, uh, the difficult relationships of people, yeah, yeah. exactly. Like, was that something, like, did you, I mean, sorry to use your British editor's phrase, what was it? An, an emotional lacuna. <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah. Like, was was that, like, did you know you were diving into that, or were you also, like, building up walls around that, and then you had to break them down? Um, that was a thing that I think, um, do you know, when you make, when there become, I was, I'm really, really obsessed with a friend named Woods documentary, the Martin Scorsese documentary, Pretend It's a City, and there's a part where friend named Woods is like, 
<laughs> the first time you make a mistake, it's a mistake. The second time you make a mistake, it's like mea culpa. And the third time you make a mistake, you're like, oh, I'm bad at this, and I might be bad at this forever. <laughs> um, and I think I had reached a point where it's like, I'm bad at this. <laughs> like, relationships are going badly, and at some point, the common denominator is me. And like, if I want to figure out, like, if that's the thing I want in my life functionally, I should probably think about it a little bit before just doing the next one. And so I think writing about that for me, that's where the um, the X Files essay comes in. Is I like become a tiny Agent Scully, and I'm like, I'm gonna figure out what I'm doing wrong in this Monster of the Week series of episodes <laughs> that is my love life. And like, it turns out like it was me the whole time. <laughs> so, like, I was always gonna be part of it. Yeah, <laughs> that was always that was always gonna be yeah. part of it. Um, which. <laughs> Yeah, I know, I know, I got it. Um, I mean, in a way, it's, I know it's, we're, we're, it's kind of what we've been talking about the whole night. It's kind of the through line in the essay collections. But it's making mistakes yeah. and learning from those mistakes and sometimes not learning from those mistakes. But are, is this an essay collection that you hope readers take something away from and then, like, they're going to not make their mistakes because they're learning from yours? Or do you think this is just like, they're going to make their own mistakes as well? Like, what do you hope readers take away from this collection? Sorry, that, that was a big one. No, yeah. I love that question so much. No, like, no one should learn anything from me. I do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. I think, I think that um, part of the first essay in the book is about all the messed up love stories in my family. And there's a part where you talk about how, like, Understanding your own mistakes, understanding the mistakes of people in your family before, or their sadnesses or their traumas, doesn't always protect you from like having to go through it yourself. Um, and so, I don't know. I think the thing that I hope people take away from the book is just that, like, I, I don't know why this was not obvious to me. Probably we're all very beautiful, adjusted people, and this is obvious to you. But it was like, if it seems like, if I know there's a lot of love in my life and there are a lot of beautiful things in my life that I value, but it doesn't fit into a kind of story that I can like post about every Mother's Day on Instagram, or it doesn't fit into like a way that it's easy to talk about to people in your life who maybe have different, I don't know, they're living different kinds of lives than you, that it's okay to do your own kind of storytelling to make those things meaningful and to put them up and to be like, yeah, that is love in my life and that is love in my life and this is the thing I value. And I tell a story about it in a way that makes it legible to me it may be legible to others if you care about that, but mostly legible to yourself. Um, and I think this whole book was like the process of me doing that for myself. That's incredible. That's a really lovely answer. Can I ask how the family has reacted to? <laughs> well, luckily the answer is good. Well, to be fair, my sister's only read the parts about her. Um, <laughs> I can say that because she didn't manage to come tonight, but I love her very much, and I wish she were here. Um, but she is with the tiny reincarnation of Shirley Jackson, who is my niece. Um, but no, everyone has read the things. Um, everyone has read the things. Everyone is okay with the things. And they like left me a voicemail. Being like, we have some things that you got wrong. And I was like, oh no. And then it was like weird miscellany about my great great grandfather and like which cowboy series he was cast in or not cast in. And I was like, that's so in it. Is there anything else? And they were like, no. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. So I don't know. I have, there's a part in the Belushi essay where I talk about how like there's a fake tomb, there's a public tomb. And this book is the public tomb I am giving to you. <laughs> and there is there is a real tomb. And that's not in the book, because it's not for a book. You know what I mean? Like, I think you get to pick and choose the parts of your life that you need to write about to communicate what you have to say to other people. And you don't have to give everyone everything. And some things you can keep just for you. And those can be nice things, and those can be hard things. And so it felt really empowering to draw those lines for myself. And Family feels pretty great, but we're in those lines. <laughs> <laughs> Nailed it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, real quick though, I just did just a little like, were you apprehensive about it? Like you're talking about how they react, but like, were you like, or were you like, okay, no, that's that's gonna be alright. No, I was neurotic about absolutely everyone who's in this book to the point that some of my friends have been like, just let it go, like it's fine. <laughs> and I'm like, but in this part where I talk about how we wore that hat that one time, they're like, yeah, yeah, I wore that hat. It's fine. Right. Like it's cool. So everyone who's still in my life, I showed like four different versions of things along the way, and they all said yes, and that is not a thing I think is necessary, or I'm not like saying like that's the ethics of nonfiction. That is like the choice that I made, and everyone does it their own way, and anyone who tells you otherwise, I think, 
and go shit their ass. Like, it, you have to do it the way you have to do it, and we're all different people. Um, but for me, that was important. Yeah, the ethics of neurotic nonfiction. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll teach you this class, probably. Yeah. Well, okay, it was just, and don't forget, yeah. we got a couple more of the short stories if you want to bring them up. But, but, but I was going to ask, so, like, I mean, you are an incredible teacher. I think there are many of your own. Yeah, go ahead, clap out, students. <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, yeah. oh, nice. um, is, is, is there a way that tackling nonfiction is, is changing the way that you're teaching writing? Is, is there a time when you're going to teach more nonfiction? Like, yeah, I think um, I think the interesting thing about for me about writing nonfiction and thinking about how I teach fiction is that I've been really a pain in the ass to my students recently in terms of pushing them to be like, what was the thing this character felt when they said? Like I'm really like anti subtlety now because at least in my life, like the things everything is so fucking complicated. It's like even if you just state the thing itself, it's so complicated. And like yes, there is subtlety, and yes, there is beauty, but there's no need to have like a hills for white elephants long scene in which finally we realize one fact of the story. Like tell me the fucking fact of the story, and then like deal with it. Like deal with it for 15 pages. And I'm really interested. I'm more interested in that than I think I am the little puppet play. Yet. And now do you get it? Um, which I think is good for fiction as well as not fiction. It's that the hills were elephants, right? I got that one right. Yeah, yeah that was it. That was the whole. That's the whole point of that one, right? That was that was that was Hemingway shape. That, that was no, no, no. That's all it was. I, I didn't need to read deeper into it. No. No. Yeah, no. I'd be horrible in your classes, is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> uh, so okay, so I want. I, I do want to get back to those stories, but I do want to ask like these these kind of last two questions, which is, what books do you see this book in conversation with? Like, were there books that inspired you? Other writers, or yeah. like, what books do you see this book? In? I am like an unapologetic Melissa Gibo stan. I just love everything that she touches, and I think the way she writes about her life is like reflective without ever trying to resolve things into a like, fat moral, and I just like really love that about her. Um, the Empathy Exams really did a number on me when I first read it, and that thinking of like, where am I, how do I relate to others, what are the boundaries of that, and like, how, how to be ethical about that, but still be yourself. I think was really a big part of that. Um, I mean, I, we maybe all worship with the altar of rocks idea, that we even need to say it, but like it's worth saying. Um, I think that reading her writing and actually also Emily Nussbaum's writing about culture is the thing I really love because it's like they're talking about TV or they're talking about art they love, but they're really using it to talk about themselves, and I found that hugely inspirational. And, and take away from that. That said, writing a book, as you obviously know, is no easy task, and especially one that is like kind of open and vulnerable and out there. This one is. Uh, it takes a lot of hard work, and I, I I tend to think that a writer is doing that because they see a hole in the literary landscape that they want to fill. So you have these books that you love. You have these writers who are doing similar things. But what was it with this that you were kind of looking to fill in like nonfiction landscape? I love that idea. I don't know if I had any sense. I don't think I would ever write anything if I thought it and it was actually good to write it. <laughs> and so I don't think I was thinking about Fuck that. Up. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I think that's like a really beautiful thing. And I, I mean, I'm going to be mortifying for a second, but like reading your memoir, I really felt like, oh my God, this is what I'm allowed to do. Third back Massachusetts coming out next week. This, um, this is playing real dirty. <laughs> rollicking adventure, but then with a lot of deep thinking and deconstructing and unpacking that along the way. So like, I see how that, I, I hadn't seen that before. Um, I really, I had it, and so I really love that. I think for me, it's like, so often in a conversation, someone's like, oh yeah, they ask me a very normal question. Like, how do you feel about blah? And I'm like, do you have like three weeks? I'm gonna go home, I'm gonna sit down, I'm gonna make a murder board, I'm gonna write about it, I'll revise it, I'll take it to you, I'll get feedback. Like, I, the way my brain works, is such that it's hard for me to communicate what I'm trying to say all the time. And I think that the process of writing this was more about me not filling a gap in any landscape, but being like, hey, look, I answered that question you asked me five years ago, person who doesn't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was really good. That was really good. 
I'm, listen, I'm, we're going to open it up to questions from the audience very shortly. And so I want you to think of your incredible, thoughtful, much better than my own questions that you're going to ask. But I did, I mean, you just said it, and then I cracked the joke, and I literally had in my notebook, like, let somebody from the audience ask this one, but now I'm going to ask. Yeah. It, what was it like when the crane, when that original essay comes out, that happens, it's the question you're getting asked a million times, I'm sure, but like you said, you're writing and kind of almost imagining a world where people aren't going to read this, and then all of a sudden it feels like everybody does. I mean, it's, it's like anyone's going to read it, but it's like, if you're a writer person, a reader person, like, you publish something in the Paris Review, you're already like, holy fucking shit, I got to publish something in the Paris Review, that's amazing. And then you assume that like the people on your block who are the people who read the Paris Review will read it. And then it was like, we had a block party, and then a lot of other people came to the block party. <laughs> and that's both like a great party and kind of scary and not what I expected. Um, but... Yeah, it was a wild time. My, my favorite thing that happened during that moment, because it's like, a crazy thing happens to you, but you're still just yourself. So I'm just like still at home in my house and upstate New York, Central New York, and I'm like freaking out because the like, things are happening and people are sending me screenshots of tweets and I am in my garden and I'm panicking and I'm like furiously pruning my tomatoes to be like, everything is fine, everything is the same, nothing <laughs> is happening. And then I went inside and I had like an exciting phone call and publishing team of people. And I was like, yeah, I'm like, a good thing is happening, something's happening. And for like one second, I was like, popped up. And then a snail fell out of my hair. <laughs> and then another snail fell out of my hair. Because as I was pruning the tomatoes, they had sort of found their way in there. And it's like, you know what I mean? Like, the world will like hold you up for a moment and be like, oh my god, exciting things. And then like, at least for me, it's always like a pretty quick transition to like, you know, the best else in your hair. So like, don't get too fucked up. <laughs> Here's the snails in your hair. Everyone, see Jen. <laughs> one last, just one last short story collection. Uh, sh sorry, short story that's humorful but bleak. Yeah, what else did I make? Mean? That was so bleak. <laughs> um, I'm going to have to check it out in the middle of the Q&A. I'm okay. going to have to go back to this a little bit. No. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold you to it. I'll write them out. If anybody yeah. can ask me, I'll email you the syllabus afterwards. Funny stories about that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, questions from the audience. Right there. Hi. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask, as someone who traditionally writes fiction, what do you think is the artistic value of, you know, labeling this collection as nonfiction? Mm. Yeah. What? What a good question. Um, I mean, I think. I think it tied my own hands in terms of what I could and could not make happen. And I think that even in the first drafts of some of my fiction, that I had to go back and revise. And certainly when there are characters you love, and you're like, and now I give them a happy ending. Like I wrote a whole thing where someone's father was like, and he's alive again. And then I was like, I have to revise that. There's no universe where that's plausible or OK. And I think it's tricky enough in fiction to make myself tell a story that feels emotionally cohesive. Um, and the temptation to do that in my own life, and to be like, and then the family was happy, and then the lovers were happy. Like, I think I think calling it nonfiction means I hold myself to the standard of like having to look at the things that are hard and like tell them as they were, including like all the things that are on me, um, and then also find a way to make meaning of them, not by resolving them, not by making them nicer, but by like saying like, here's what this meant to me as it was, without the fictional book, which I love so much. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> My question is back for what you just said. So like in this collection, you have essays that are like very biographical, autobiographical, that's just you or your family going far back into time. And then you have some that are come from more of like a cultural or pop cultural criticism space, but they're all very like very intense and very real and have a lot of you in them in very real ways. 
as you were writing, did you have moments that were like easier and more joyful to get that sort of stuff to come, and others that were harder? And I'm curious about where where everything fell. Yeah, totally. And I think actually, so I um, I got the chance to read the audiobook of this myself, which was fun, and I didn't intend to do originally. Did you just do this? It's a wild. It's wild. <laughs> yeah. You read your whole book out loud to yourself. No one does that. In like a closet. <laughs> <In a closet. laughs> and if you're me, you go to Ruby's bar for lunch break every day. <laughs> Across the way from the studio and be like, oh god. <laughs> um, it's like slow key cell for Ruby's bar. Um but I think that as I was reading it out loud, I realized which parts were hard and not hard. Like there were things that I felt along the way, but the, the audiobook director was like, if it gets the parts that are sort of hard, then we can take a break. And I was like, I'm fine, I'm gonna be fine. And then I got to like parts about my grandmother, and I was like, oh, I'm feeling feelings in this closet. And, so, <laughs> and then like when it was time to read like things I had to say about the X Files, I'm like, is someone letting me say things about the X Files into a microphone? <laughs> I've been waiting for this day. <laughs> so. Yeah, definitely different things. I think there's nothing like reading it out loud to teach you how you really feel about it. It also like it blows my mind. Like that might be the last time in a long time that you read it cover to cover. And when what? After when? all these different iterations, isn't that a what? Like yeah. I walked out of it and the sound sound out of guy was just like wanted to give him a hug and he was like, oh, 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 okay, like, <laughs> I got like I got something after this, so I got, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Um, what a wild experience. Yeah. In the way back, I see you. Yeah, um, did you uh, write any essays that were eventually cut um, either in the writing process really early on or like later on by your editor? Yeah, no, there right. are things that I wrote. So essays that got cut is the question that like I wrote but didn't make it in. Um, there are essays that I started to write and they didn't come together. Like sometimes I'm obsessed with something and it turns out if I write about it for 10 pages, it's not an essay, it's just me talking about something. Um, so there are things that didn't go in. There are other essays that I wrote and then when I did the balance of like, uh, essentially ethics, I guess, like more harm than good, um, is this a thing that would be more harm than good if I put it down into the world? I cut things like that. I made that judgment call for. Um, and there's some things that I just chose not to write about because I was like, that's, that's not a thing I want to share <laughs> at this particular block party. Um, and so, yeah, things, things came in and out. There were things that got added along the way. The last essay in the book, actually, was not a part of my plan for writing at all, um, but I called lovely agent friend Meredith, and I was like, I need to write an essay about my father's garden. Nothing happens. He's just happy. <laughs> she was like, so do it. And I was like, okay. <laughs> but I was like, it wasn't part of the plan, you know what I mean? But that was a, an emotional point that writing the whole book led me to, and it felt really necessary at the end. Wait, sure. quick follow-up. Yeah. What are some of the things you were obsessed with that didn't make it in? I want to hear about um, or, or even or even right now, like what's what's got you going? Well, right now it is in fact Earth Jam, so there's that, and it's also the Oneida Sex Hold Silverware Empire Mansion. Well, That's slow down. Um, yeah. Yeah. Stay, stay tuned for me rambling the Oneida Mansion, which was a free web experiment in Oneida, New York, and they were like, I don't even know, they were polyamorous, they were capitalists, they made bear traps, they there was like a story in the room who could tell you more than me. Um, but I have been super super interested in. I have a story in front of me. Field trip, and I've been it's writing about that alongside Tom Dickens. Um, so that's a thing on my list. But not in the book. <laughs> it's like 35 to 40 pages of what amounts to maybe critical theory about The Bachelor, which <laughs> I don't think anyone needs. I did not need to pee into the book, but I really enjoyed writing it. I'll just say, if you want to send that around again, we're going to do the syllabus. We'll share the 40 pages on The Bachelor. I think I saw is that one there. Go ahead. <laughs> oh shit, that was, yeah. In case people didn't hear, do you want to repeat the word? Yeah, no, Kelly just said that this book is a Libra manifesto, and I second that statement. <laughs> um, but if I were to represent it as a tarot card, which is a thing that I love and do, uh, what would it be? Yeah, I think it might be somewhere between the moon card, where it's like, Idealizing things, everything looks so beautiful, and that's like a beautiful way of being. But also, it's like it's a little unstable, and maybe you're making things seem other than they are. But maybe with a little five of cups mixed in, which is the guy who like 
is swirling around in his own set. And I was like, there's no tea left. And it's like, there's tea right there. And he's like, no tea. <laughs> 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 Because this is a tremendous collection. Ladies and gentlemen, CJ. Howard. 